All right. Um, I'd like to call the order um, to order the uh, December meeting of the South Carolina Commission on Disabilities and Special Needs. Um, welcome, everyone. And um, Vicki Thompson, could you read the um, welcome notice meeting of statement? Notice of meeting statement, please. A news from the state time and place of the December 13th, 2018 commission meeting was distributed December 10th, 2018. The appropriate media and other groups or individuals who have requested notification. The announcement and agenda were posted at the Department of Disability and Special Needs Central Administrative Office and on the website. The public has been notified that accommodations such as interpreters, the assistance or other assistance will be provided to individuals with disabilities and special needs to request this advance. Thank you very much. May I have adoption of the agenda, please? So moved. May I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, may I have the introduction of guest? And may I start in the front and go to the back door? Thank you very much. Uh oh. Kathleen Roberts, Witten Center Parents Club, and I always miss that. Parent of uh, two children that <clears throat> have were served by Witten Center and UDSM for over 31 years and have now passed away. I'm Roy Roberts, the other half. <laughs> we're so glad to see y'all here together. Thank you. <laughs> Pat Mellie, DDSN. Lisa Leeds, DDSN. Susan Beck, DDSN. Rufus Brett, DDSN. Deborah Heather, Person, Person County. Kathleen Moore, then PNA. Beth Franco, Executive Director, PNA. John Ditchman, DDSN. Becky Hill, Crystal Center. Randy Davis, Whitman Center. Nancy Hall, DDSN. Angela Wright, Midland Center. John Mann, PDSN. Beth Lundy, Bright Start. Bob Jones, the Pride Center with the Newberry Board. Mike Moss of Kellen County Disabilities Board. Brenda Davis, Chester Lunch of the Board. Sherry Preston, Northwood Services, Carolina. Sarah Brownson, Spinal Cord Injury Association. Donna Hall, Beth Cox Center. Ray Miller, DB Council. Daniel Davis, Autism Division. Melissa Ritter, DSN. Van Horner, DSN. And then, I see, I was told. Uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Cameron Hackman. Daniel Bob, Cameron Hackman. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad everybody's here for. Um, December meeting. Um, Chris, could you do the invocation, please? Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this day where we can come together as citizens of this state to discuss solutions for the people that we serve. Lord, we're also mindful on this day and this holiday season of all that it means to each of us. And let us remember during this time our fellow citizens who are hungry, poor, lonely, and disabled. Let us all give freely to them with our love and compassion. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you. Um, the approval of the minutes of the November 15th, 2018 commission meeting. Do you have a motion? Move to, move to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Um, Deborah McPherson. I hope y'all don't mind my coming every month to talk, and I know y'all probably feel like I'm a pain and, and, and a thorn in your side, but um, I do mean well. Uh, my remarks are directed toward the proposed changes to DDS in the record 53507, Companion Healthcare Consent. The Attorney General issued an opinion saying that DDSN has authority to make health care decisions and no person with authority is available to act. Despite um, that authority being removed in the Adult Health Care Consent Act, by advising local boards and providers that this authority exists, DDSN assumes liability if the courts disagree with the Attorney General's interpretation. 
I believe that the commission is making a serious mistake by attempting to address this issue by directive instead of promulgating regulations. I support the policy committee's recommended change that individuals who are capable of making their own decisions then provided reasonable accommodations and devices to allow them to make their own decisions. For too long, DDSN and DHHS have forced persons with capacity to make their own decisions to fight for years to get a speech device. I applaud this change in policy and hope that the agency will put their opinions into practice. I also support the policy committee's recommended change that if an individual with a disability is suspected to be unable to give valid consent, the individual will be referred to two physicians, one of whom is not employed by DDSN and not a DDSN contracted provider. This proposed change would help address a potential conflict of interest in determining the capacity of an individual with a disability to consent to health care. I do not support the long-standing practice of consumers who do not have capacity for providing consent to select providers of Medicaid services, to health care procedures, and to plans of care. In any reason, no hello, we can't hear you. To mitigate conflicts of interest. The proposed changes to the directive include provisions for supported decision making. Proponents of supported decision making have glossed over the issue of capacity to contract when discussing powers of attorney or shared decision making arrangements. Powers of attorney and supported decision making arrangements may be attractive alternatives to guardianship for those who have capacity to enter into contracts. Such arrangements may be viable options for people who understand the terms and conditions of the documents they are signing, and if thorny issues such as undue influence and conflict of interest are avoided, but those are big ifs. Providers who receive band funds have a financial incentive to steer consumers into services which profit themselves. Not only do they not have qualifications to determine capacity to consent, but they're in a position to exercise undue influence. Neither are case managers qualified to determine whether consumers have capacity. They're trained by DDSN to treat all consumers who have not been determined by a court to be incompetent as if they have capacity to consent. That is a serious area, especially in cases where a psychologist has determined in order to meet level of care that the person has intellectual capacity limitations that require institutional level of care. Persons who do not have intellectual capacity to understand healthcare decisions must have those decisions made by persons or persons with authority to act on the adult healthcare consent act, where a guardian has not been appointed. What is happening on the ground is that some providers are either treating persons who are unable to consent as if they have capacity and causing them to sign consents, or simply choosing and obtaining consents from the family member who agrees with the provider despite the fact that the family member with higher priority are not even aware of the health care being provided to their loved one. It's a rare occurrence for there to be no relative available to make health care decisions, yet it's common occurrence for some of the boards or providers to sign consents. The proposed directive does not explain the risk and or consequences of failing to obtain consent for the person or persons who have authority in violation of the Adult Health Care Consent Act. I certainly do not want to take away the rights of those individuals with disabilities who have capacity to make decisions, but I'm also very concerned about the protections that need to be in place for those individuals who don't have the capacity to make decisions. It's this group that are most vulnerable and can easily be influenced. While we are all influenced to some extent by opinions and actions of others, people with disability with conditions that affect their cognitive functioning are more vulnerable to being influenced by others. Normal influence can cross the line and become undue influence very easily. And the risk of this happening is even greater when the adult is dependent on the person doing the influencing. Given the ongoing men's, Valentine, and Timpson lawsuits, as well as other incidents I've been brought to my attention, I would be extremely cautious of including supported decision-making in DDSN Directive 530-507 without written policies and organizational separations in place to mitigate conflicts of interest and a clear explanation of the obligation to have persons with priority give consents. Decisions regarding those individuals with disabilities who lack capacity to consent should be made by the probate court where no guardian exists and no family member with priority is available to give consent. Finally, the commission should ensure Alliant conducts reviews of providers for compliance with the requirements of the Adult Health Care Consent Act and Directive 53507. 
In summary, I'm re recommending that the Commission, one, promulgate regulations regarding obtaining consent, two, develop written policies and organizational separations to mitigate conflicts of interest and provide a clear explanation of the consequences of failing to obtain <coughs> consent from the person or persons who have authority under the Adult Health Care Consent Act, and three, ensure that Alliant conducts reviews of the providers for compliance with the requirements of the Adult Health Care Consent Act and Directive 53507. Those providers found to be out of compliance should be sanctioned. And I sent you, I guess it was about a week ago, there was an article in the Greenville News about a family. Uh, I think it, it really shows <clears throat> the dilemma that some families are having. $5,000 is not easy for some people to be able to afford to be able to obtain guardianship. And there needs to be assistance in this state too for those that do need to obtain guardianship to be able to do that. Um, I'm just, I, I will say this, the, the stories I continue to hear about some of the things that are going on just blows my mind. And what really concerns me is when families are not being kept informed of what's going on. Uh, individuals being taken to emergency rooms and the family, you know, an aunt's been told, but the family has no idea that that's going on. Um, this needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Can I have co commissioners update? Yes. Um, thank you, Chairwoman Ravenel. Um, I have asked to come today um, my friend Tanya LaBeouf, who um, um, contacted me over the Thanksgiving holiday regarding um, an incident. Um, and I, I have been greatly concerned about her inability to find um, appropriate help and services in a time of crisis. Um, it's led me to believe, uh, I, I'm still learning what all we do have available in our system. But it certainly led me to believe that we need to invest more resources in severe behavior um, um, resources for individuals in South Carolina. Um, I, I've asked Tanya to come and, and just kind of tell the story of what she's been through and is still going through um, trying to find an appropriate placement and service for her son. But um, I think it is a wake up call for us. So thank you, Tanya. You're welcome. welcome. My name is Tanya LaBeouf. Uh, my son is Cameron Heckman. He is 18 years old, was diagnosed with autism at age two, uh, was in the school system for quite a while, but once he went to middle school, was not working well. His aggression level went higher. Bullying, trying to mainstream him, was not working. Um, so I found the kind of services of the Autism Academy of South Carolina, homeschooled him, uh, received all day ABA, saw tremendous benefits. Um, inner puberty. I found out partially full well that puberty affects autism. Um, I've seen him in the last three months, four months, uh, change, be more aggressive, uh, not be um, very open to being told no, disappointment. Um, I've got five copies here. Y'all are welcome to have them. This is a copy of a letter that I wrote after our incident to um, the 46 senators and 124 House members. I've also hand delivered it to the governor's office and the um, lieutenant governor's office. And I've actually spoken to the governor's office um, as well because uh, it's such a concern. But um, too much. Uh, three months now. October the 22nd, our house burned. Um, Cameron's going through his aggression stage, uh, which is more frequent. And when our house was burning and the fire company was, was extinguishing our house, um, sitting on the couch with him outside in our shop and he just attacks me and pulls my hair up by the roots. Um, I'm thinking, Okay, this has happened more frequently. I'm not thinking anything more serious than that would happen, even though that's serious. Um, come, you know, we go to live in a hotel. We're still in a hotel through February. He's been through a lot. He's been through sickness that I've been through for six years. He's been through the house burning, um, living in a new place. We're living there through probably February until our house is redone. Um, 
and it's the day before Thanksgiving. He's just not listening. He's wound up, and I tell him, you need to go to bed. And he flew into a rage. Uh, my daughter was six, she's 16. She was right beside him. He pulled her hair out by the roots. He slapped her uncontrollably, was kicking her. I go to her aid, transfers to me, same thing. Back and forth, back and forth. My husband's not home, it's just us. Um, after transferring that back and forth about four times, he pulls my face to his face and bites me on the side of my face, which is the picture you see. Um, immediately swell up out to here. The next day, black and blue all on the side of my face, down my throat. Um, we had to hide in the room, lock the door, until he calmed down. Um, this is the same child that's sitting very calmly right there most of the time. Uh, he is that way, but when the switch flips, there's no, there's no stopping him. He's not this little anymore. He's 5'10", 175, wears an 11 shoe of men size. Um, I had to call the police. Police had no idea what to do. Columbia Police, no idea. They were like, can we not work this out between us? I'm like, this child's disabled. We need to find a facility that can help with this aggression issue. He said, we'll go, go to the hospital tonight and they should be able to transport them the next day. Mm -hmm. So I went by what the police told me. I went to the hospital and got treatment for my face. I'm laying in the bed and they call me and say, your son's here. Did you know your son was here? And I said, no, I didn't know. You know, they wouldn't let me go see him. Um, so I'm thinking I'm going to get a call the next day to discuss where he will be transported for severe aggression treatment. <clears throat> he sat in the hospital 12 days. Emergency room. No help, no ABA, nobody, nobody would take him. We had a total of nine, which I have all the facilities listed in a footnote in that letter um, that would, that either said he's too autistic, we don't take your personal private insurance, or even though I'm in your state, we don't take your in-state Medicaid, which Cameron has Medicaid as well. So I had the ability to pay through private insurance and Medicaid that could cover what private insurance did not, but was being denied. So he sat, and he sat. They told me that he sh I should not see him because they were they didn't have the resources to handle him if he had another meltdown. Mm -hmm. And he did have two or three episodes in the hospital where he slapped a couple of people who were trying to draw blood on him or get his blood pressure. Um, <laughs> But finally, Hall Institute stepped up. But that's a mental institution. It's not a developmental institution. They made it clear, we do not help autistic kids. We can get his medication leveled to what we think he should have being pubescent. Um, but that's the end of it. They had not one incident with Cameron, but they cater to keeping those kids calm not helping them with their therapy to see what triggers them so they can learn to calm themselves. Um, he stayed in Hall until yesterday. So he was gone from home for 21 days with no ABA, the beautiful ABA that he was getting at the Autism Academy. That suddenly stopped. And 21 days, no ABA, no help. I still don't know what I'm going to do. The only options that I'm having right now are out of state. Monroe Meyer, Nebraska, uh, Marcus Autism Center in Atlanta, or Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. The only one that's inpatient is Baltimore, Maryland, Krieger. All of them have a wait list. The only one that has reached out to me to do an intake video conference was Monroe Meyer, Nebraska, which they did yesterday, Dr. Wayne Fisher. He said Cameron qualified completely for his program. But, and I'm thinking that he's not severe in, enough to qualify for those programs because he's not constantly having aggression. He said quite the contrary. 
he's unpredictable. That's harder to treat. So yes, he does qualify. And so they're starting paperwork. So I may be moving to Nebraska for three months. I'm hurting my family. I'm going, I've already went from a one income family. I mean, I'm sorry, two income family to a one income family. And because I'm not working, my husband had to take over getting the insurance, $800 a month. So I went from a two income family to a one income family to a three quarter income family. And now I'm gonna have extra expenses of living in Nebraska for three months because I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to help my son. But this shouldn't happen. This should, this should be something that's in my state. I shouldn't have a, a place that could help him that's an hour drive away that doesn't take my insurance, that doesn't take my in-state Medicaid. So I feel like that's where DDSN could step up and do whatever they could to make those resources a little more available and um, hopefully get his treatment where this never happens again. If my daughter wasn't with me that night, I think he would have hurt me worse. He, he hurt me severely. I still am having to go to the doctor every few days and have fluid drain from my face because this bite was so severe. Um, it's totally turned our world upside down. It was hard to see my son in a psychiatric ward. Um, he's a sweet kid, but, but he, he has that time, those times where it's unpredictable. You, you don't ever see him coming. I don't really know that I know what triggers him, but I need the help for them to help me show me what to do in those situations. And I'd appreciate any help that y'all would give me and I'll answer any questions that y'all have. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. And I think this is something we are definitely working with. We know that we have a, um, a need for it in the state. We are working. Um, I see Rufus um, Britt, who's been working on it. So, if it could possibly help. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much Thanks for listening. Your story. <coughs> I hope was, um, I'm going to talk on a, a very happy topic. Um, do you have a picture for me? I only have, could you put it up, please? Two weeks ago, I went to the Heart um, um, put on a production, and this is the only picture that I could get. I mean, I'm, you know, but this is the girl who was one of um, a friend of mine's daughter, um, Liza Kirsten, and she was. It, it's a um, they did a, an original production, a musical comedy called Star, and they had about 50 kids who have been in the Heart program. Um, who have disabilities in Charleston. And um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful program. And so I was able to get this one picture. And, um, and But it really was fun if you ever um, ever hear about heart. And um, they're also, this summer, they're going to be in um, the Spoleto Festival. So it really is a cute, 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 cute program. So thank you. And thank you so much for bringing her today. I think that's something we all need to know. All right, Vicki Thompson. We okay. need the policy committee report, please. Yes, um, we have met and obtained the input from HHS and Able South Carolina and many other advocates and, <coughs> and have um, put together our best version of the policy about health care consent. Um, we did not cover everything in this policy that everyone would like to see, but uh, it is supposed to be about health care consent. So the policy does broaden the definition to include autism. It defines the scope for power of attorney. It broadens the definition of qualified providers to include people like physician assistants and behavior analysts and licensed psychologists. It provides for reasonable accommodations and supportive decision making for people who are able to make their own decisions. It requires that one of two physicians deciding on the person's ability to consent not be an employee. 
with the contractor for DDSN, and that is a huge step toward removing conflict of interest that has been mentioned. And it includes the Attorney General's opinion that gives us something to work with when making decisions in light of the fact that we are still not technically listed in the law. So we have to hang our hat right now on that Attorney General's opinion, and this directive does that. So on behalf of the committee, uh, we recommend that this policy pass. You want to make a motion? Um, I'll make that motion. Okay. Do we have more? any more discussion on this? I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. It passes. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the hard work you put into that. All right, Mary, can we have the state director's report, please? You, you may. Um, I'm actually really happy to be here this morning to talk about some um, directional pivots we've been working on and uh, I think exciting possibilities. And so this month we're talking about planning and collaboration. And um, anybody who knows me knows I'm a bit of a planner. I have long-term plans, I have short-term plans, I have contingency plans. But what I love more than planning is to actually put something in action. And so every day I pour Rufus, I ask him, have we ordered the furniture yet? Because I would like to have that ordered. And he says, it's, it's, we're working on it. But after a couple of months of researching and asking questions and reviewing, we have begun down uh, what I would say is a charted course of change and collaboration. And if you think about this agency, we're kind of unique if you look at state government and the fact that we're a single mission agency. When we have one thing we have to do. And uh, which I think is, gives us an opportunity to be a little bit more innovative than a lot of other agencies because they have so many things to say grace over. Mm -hmm. So, but what I'm looking at that as a single mission, I'm also thinking, but we don't have to be in this mission alone. And for the longest time, we've kind of charted that course on our own. And I don't think we should be doing that. Our folks are served by other agencies. And it's important that we form strong partnerships so that we can give timely and effective supports and also know where folks are in the support system. As we look through our waiting list, we want to make sure we give you a proper picture of who's on that waiting list and what supports they're receiving from other agencies besides ours. And um, we're working on that because agencies have trouble pulling reports from one another. So we're trying to get all that information together. But my hope is that we could be more innovative in how we approach service delivery in the future with new partnerships. We want to streamline processes and procedures and make them more understandable and accessible. Um, the story we heard today is not foreign to me. I deal with it almost every day. Um, unfortunately, I wish the story was unique. Unfortunately, it is not. Um, and it's not in my case. And puberty hits our children hard, and it's not just autistic children. I've got a child with Down syndrome, and puberty has knocked her on her rear end. It's literally knocked me there, too. Um, so I think that I, I understand, and I empathize. Now we just got to figure out. We can't solve it all, but we need to work towards a solution, that's for sure. One innovation is that we are going to be live streaming the Skype link to these commission meetings for everyone. It's gonna be on our website and it'll start January 1. I always thought it was a technical problem, but apparently that's not the case. So we just made the decision that these will now be public meetings and they will be online. We have been uh, planning with the staff here and on the 4th, we did a management strategy session and our strategy session was to build the infrastructure so we can actually take the agency's vision plan or strat uh, strategic plan and move it forward without us seeing how we fit into that plan and what needs to be done. The plan is sitting there as a piece of paper and that cannot remain the same. I would like to see the agency communicate and act with clarity so that you would understand what we're saying and our forms are more simple and our modes of communication are simpler. And everybody knows me knows I'm just simple. <laughs> so, and we need to be consistent how we treat one person, we treat everybody. 
Um, somebody asked me once, actually, I think it was an oversight committee. They asked, how are we, how are people getting in touch with us? Well, the folks that call, we answer the phone, but I'm also worried about the people who are not mm -hmm. calling and the folks that are just out there just trying to make it from day to day. I worry about them too. I want to know what they have to say. And I want to be connected to folks. I feel that being a foreign provider, doing this every day, and also being a family member, I feel connected to the community. And now I need to get this agency connected to them too. The core functions of the agency being policy and regulation, oversight and monitoring, assessing and planning, and education and training. We talked about assessing and planning as we need to drill down on our waiting list. We need to see who's out there possibly in crisis or I always call them on the bubble of crisis where we have people that some days it's fine, but then there's some days it's not so fine. We need to know who they are. We don't even know who those folks are right now. So it's very hard to plan like for residentially placing people. We don't even know who's in the, I call them feeder pipes. Who's coming in from DSS? Who's coming from DJJ? Who's coming, who's aging out of our psychiatric uh, placements? We need to identify those and present the state uh, general assembly with an actual projection of, y'all need to move, <laughs> actual projection of uh, needs, not basically going year to year and say, we need this many beds. I wanna say we're anticipating in two years, we will need this, in three years, we will need this, and in five years, we will need this. So we can start the process of developing those programs because they take almost a year to get online. So it is hard to say, I get the money now, but I'm not gonna be actually able to expend it till next year. If I can project it, we might be able to get money knowing that it will not go online for a year. So that needs to be done. I want to be in the position to implement all these core functions in the best and um, most efficient manner. So that's what we're looking at now. When we talk about collaboration, one of the more exciting um, meetings I had was we had a steering committee of uh, providers and um, actually I had a fellow from uh, York that works in the technical school uh, at the high school. And we have uh, came up with a plan to present to the Department of Education to ask for a DSP credential in high school. Um, a la the same as the CNA credential they have in high school. There's so many different tracks they have. It's kind of exciting, actually. Um, we met with Angel, Angel Malone. I keep wanting to call her Angela, and that is not her name. Her name is Angel, who's the Director of Career and Technology Development at the Department of Education. And she's going to go ahead and present the proposal of the high school career curriculum for DSPs. Actually, I think they're presenting at the end of January or February, and they hope to have a pilot program in two high schools in conjunction with two um, disability boards in all of next year, which I think is kind of an exciting prospect. But um, now that we've got time, it's not just the orientation we want to place here with the children uh, in high school young people in high school, I guess they're not children at that point in their lives. But we want to, to not just put in their introduction disability so they can choose this as a career, which is really important, instead of falling into it as a career, to choose it. Or being voluntold, as I was pushed into it back in the day. Um, we want them to have training in effective skills training, so we can actually get back to our basics of doing training in our homes. And person-centered thinking, let's start there um, at the high school level, and also doing 40 hours of clinical work. So we're going to have to look at our policies and procedures that will allow that, that uh, young person to come into our work environments and actually get that hands-on experience. So again, we're looking at the full term. We need two high schools and two agencies who would agree to partner and be the pilot locations. And I'm hoping that the fellow that was sitting on our steering committee would allow, you know, I talked to his superintendent and be allowing that the York High School, Comprehensive High School, would be one of those pilot places. Um, even more exciting, we're trying to develop a DSP aid position, which would also be a curriculum built in the high school, but aimed more towards special education classrooms. 
to where we would actually get to hire some of our folks with disabilities to work with our folks. And because they do that in a lot of places anyway, they're helping. So we're looking at what tasks can be done and that would free up the DSP to do more of that training and the things that are required. Because besides the training and the safety issues, they are washing dishes, cleaning the house, you know, washing clothes, cooking meals. I mean, that's our DOE uh, collaboration. We're also, I also met with Joan Meacham over and her staff at uh, DSS. And we've committed to provide training for foster parents and their adoption and foster care staff to give them a better idea as to what is available to them out there and to what is uh, what the child needs and can actually get and with help and support from the foster parent. This was um, something that I think I asked for when I started adopting forever ago and I didn't go anywhere. And then I was reminded by one of the Bright Start um, early interventionists who said, you know, we'll go out there and help. And so now I'm gonna hold that woman to her um, promise and we'll be developing a curriculum to hand over to uh, DSS so they can, we can start helping them train. The other thing is we are going to be uh, working with the children who are in foster care to see who's gonna be aging out and possibly trans ma making those home CTH ones. And we talked about that on our budget, but they were very excited about that idea and that plan. And we also agreed to staff uh, APS cases at a higher level to make something happen for the folks that have spent um, a year or more in the hospital um, on social holds is where the, what they call them. So the other thing is DSS <coughs> is interested in joining our effort to develop those 12 triage beds that we would like to develop at, at, um, at Midland Center. So they're, uh, CFO is seeing how to figure out how to get that paid for. So as a joint effort between the two agencies. And I think that anytime you go to the General Assembly and say we have a joint effort, that it should hold more weight. Um, provider collaboration, we're getting ready to make a lot of changes in early intervention, case management. We have asked for three committees. Uh, the Finance Committee has actually have a date of uh, July, uh, Jan July, that would be a long time away. January 8th, we're going to have our first meeting to talk about those band A's turning fee for service, the band B's and the band I's, which might actually be the ones that we unbundled first, and transfer of some uh, property. We'll bring those lists to you to see if this would be a good idea to get out of the real estate business, which is also a Senate oversight uh, committee recommendation. And the case management committee is going to be working on rolling out the waiver case management, okay, uh, rate changes. We have an intake overhaul we want to look at, and also the waiver enrollment overhaul to make the waiver enrollment process go a little bit quick, more quickly and the, make it more understandable. We presented our budget at the Senate Health and Human Services Subcommittee. We included the notice of additional beds to include beds for juveniles. So we think that this is, we want to take a look at the places we're paying 100% state, state dollars to see if there's any way we can turn those into a type of facility where we can actually match them, thereby increasing our capacity. Um, we requested 12 crisis stabilization beds at Midlands, those are the triage beds we were talking about, to give a safety net to the community so that if a provider does want to take somebody with high needs, that if it goes a little awry, that we have a safety net for them, not for permanent placement back in the, y'all, very still people, um, not for permanent placement back in the regional center, but for stabilization and with an agreement to return back to the community. And um, we are still waiting to find out who our new uh, subcommittee folks are because our subcommittee mm -hmm. chair uh, Merle Smith was um, actually promoted to the House Ways and Means chairperson. Regional centers, um, well, I'm just, one thing we're doing is trying to get folks out from here to see what folks out there um, are needing and just in a fun way, a team from central offices going out on, to Midlands on the 19th to do Christmas caroling which was something we used to do at York all the time. And uh, Susan uh, Beck is leading a team to Witten tomorrow. And uh, Rufus is going to Coastal Center. He says he's still not gonna sing, but he will sing. 
<laughs> it's not that hard. And I'm heading to PD and Sleepy next Friday with the team to do that. And uh, again, we've begun the process of purchasing needed equipment. Uh, one of my favorite things was making sure we got the sh shower liner beds. There's these mats that go in the, the shower tables that folks use that when we were there at Salibi, they were cracked. And I always worry that when you have those cracks, it causes, it can cause infection of skin tears and things like that. So we've, the, the new ones have been ordered and um, the larger projects, which we're trying to do is break down into smaller projects. So we don't bid on 40 roofs. We bid on one roof or two roofs and we get them done. And it'll just go quicker that way and put some control back in the uh, hands of the local folks instead of centralizing it all here from central office. And the first bulletin went out at 11.30. I hope you found that useful and informative. We're doing, I'm doing that on a weekly basis to kind of keep you in the loop instead of just engaging like right for the commission meeting, at least know what's going on week to week. And I highlight anything that I believe might be a motion or an issue at the next uh, commission meeting. Now I've included a survey in there that had no takers, but I'm hoping that'll change to see whatever subject matter y'all want more information on. And that I can do that on a one-to-one -one basis where you, you might not feel that everybody needs this, but I do. And I'll be happy to help you with that. I know this is a busy season. So um, just in conclusion, uh, and I wrote this down and I would like to read it because um, you know me, I'm kind of an emotional person. Uh, but being we're in the holiday season, I would like to end my report by saying that um, this is my hope more than a thought, actually it's, it's my prayer every day, that we enter into the new year with a tone of civility, truthfulness in content and collaboration as the road best traveled. Let partnerships and thoughtful dialogue help us set the course for the best outcomes for those we support. And I wanna wish everybody a blessed holiday. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Okay, Mary, could you discuss the high management homes? Yes, what tab plan? is that for? Okay, um, this is the um, accountability plan. I am not asking to lift the freeze on Mentor at this point. What I'm asking for is the implementation of a plan that gives specific benchmarks to meet that we will be able to collect data over the next six months. Um, to move forward um, and ask in June, at the June meeting, we'll present the evidence of the, the data that we have collected to see if you are willing to lift the uh, freeze and, um, and let them fill their high management beds. Again, that would be a recommendation based on the data that we, we, we have. Unfortunately, there wasn't any um, measurable criteria that was put in place and I think that to be fair to all parties concerned that we need to do that. We discussed this um, amongst ourselves and truthfully, this product is something that eventually I would like to see at all high management homes so we can help folks move on from that placement if possible to a less restrictive placement and thereby backfilling those beds instead of continuously building more high management beds to use that as a center of uh, training and help folks move to a, 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 another environment which is less restrictive. And then we can go ahead and backfill that bed instead of building another. <coughs> so that is the plan. So here I am asking the, the major uh, objectives are provide staffing at or above minimum required levels for high management facilities as stated in the contract. So we will go ahead and look, we will just pull random sam samples of timesheets. We'll do 25% for these various months that are listed in February, April, and June uh, to see if that is being met. It is actually the same criteria that is used for people who have outliers when they have their review. So if a board has an outlier for a high management individual, this is the criteria that is used to judge whether um, they are providing what we are paying for. So this is just another way of you know, judging what we're providing, what we're paying for. And then um, 
Mentor will provide assessments for all, all high management residents to show the individual's need for continued high management placement. This is another requirement that you have to do if you have an outlier from DDSN, if you are a board. Supervision levels in the home, um, they need to show what they are for an outing, for the home, for sleeping, for dining and bathing. They need to be specific about that because they can be different where you can have someone in the home where you check them on an hourly basis, but in the community, when you're out and about, it might be you're in constant visual supervision of that person. And this is telling you that we want to make sure that those assessments are 100% done in May, and then 100% done annually thereafter, which would be checked by an Alliant review. Mentor will have all high management BSPs in the proper format, um, and that you can, and, and current, that means they're up to date. And they, we have indicators in our uh, contract compliance review that delineates when all data has to be done, you know, monthly and how you review it and how you update plans. So that's already spelt out. And all of this needs to be done by the end of February. We will go in and monitor it in March to make sure it was done. And then we'll want, um, I have asked Mentor to redesign their residential plans to include the following things. A person residing in a high management residence should be receiving skills training to diminish the frequency and intensity of behaviors that require the high management setting. So if we ever expect to move somebody on from one high management setting out to a, less, a lesser restrictive environment, they have to be working on what has them there in the first place. So we need to be looking at that. The plan will contain information about triggers, signs of agitation, and stance re staff response to both. It'll be in their residential support plan. And plan updates to be 100% compliant by March, because they will have to do some plan amendments, I believe. Um, Mentor will just, uh, just demonstrate they have a risk management system in place that closes the loop and addresses the incident on all, um, addresses the incident on all critical incidents and A&E reports. We want the system in place by January 31st. We, how we're gonna monitor that is we're gonna pull all critical and A&E reports to check corresponding risk management review by the company to make sure that all training was provided. Like if, if the final report says we are gonna provide training, we're gonna provide, um, a, a change in environment, we're going to do plan amendments, we're going to change the BSP, whatever they recommended as their uh, reply to the incident, we're going to make sure it was done. And then, um, okay, that's that's how we're going to monitor that. And staff working in high management, this to me, this is kind of crucial. Usually folks that are in high management have underlying um, other issues besides just that, it's not just the behavior. Frequently, there'll be a dual diagnosis, um, it, it might be, and it might be autism. And if the staff isn't trained in that actual diagnosis besides just reacting to behavior, it's harder for them to understand where this behavior is coming from. So I've asked that training needs to be identified by mentor behavioral staff by February. They need to submit a plan to say how they're going to train their staff, and then the training needs to be done by June 15th. So. Do we have some other discussion? Yeah, I, I'm glad to see that we're designing a pathway for mentor. I mean, um, I think, you know, this is the first time I've seen this, but it, it mm -hmm. looks to me on paper to be good. My only concern is, is I would want to make sure that this account accountability plan is applicable to all of our high management. Yes, sir. So while it says mentor on here, mm -hmm. I think this is a good best practice and accountability standards that need to be upheld by all of them. So I would say instead of just focusing on just mentor on this, mm -hmm. it needs to be all of them. I, I firmly agree. And I think you're going to find too that yeah. the others have deficiencies oh. where this is going to help us reduce the number of incidences in the future. We've been out doing file reviews on all our high management homes, and we are finding that across the board. Um, the the To me, um, if you are going to pay a premium for something, there should be expectations wrapped around that. And for our individuals, if you have a, sometimes behavior is actually a tool people use to get something they think they need. And 
we, in fact, I think everybody in their own life, we have tools and little manipulations we all use that work for us. That might not be in the best interest of the person we're trying to get whatever we want from. So to learn how to modify that behavior in <coughs> is what we are working towards. But I believe it needs to be expectations and results mm -hmm. when we're paying that kind of premium. And um, at that point, because although if we don't do this, to be frank, we're going to be building high management homes forever because behavior is a problem. Right. And then, but training is the answer. Not to all of it. Sometimes there's just conditions that you're going to have to have a high level of supervision over to keep everybody safe. And that's fine, but that's not everybody. So for wherever we can move on in their life and help them to get a life and move on and move out to better things, that's what we're supposed to be in for. That's an outcome. So yes, no, yes, no. That is definitely my plan. But right now I was tasked to introduce a plan to get mentor, uh, to, to let them have a path to say your freeze could be lifted if you do these things. But my goal is to sit down with all high management providers and say, this is the best way to become an expert in high management to do this and help train your people. And if you don't have a risk management plan, we'll help you implement one. Right. So yes, I agree. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. Um, I'm curious how much, how many of these objectives are above and beyond what they're already contractually required to do? Do you understand what I'm asking? Like the first one says mentor will provide staffing at or above the minimum required level. Right now in their contract, they in their contract, they have an actual staffing pattern that they have to have like two on second shift and two. The truth of the matter is, is staffing is required in our standards already based on the individual's needs. So if I'm staffing a house, say I have a four bed CTH2 and I've got four individuals in there and all four of them are one on one. Well, then I can't put two staff in there. That would be a four person house or staff. I would never do that because that's just, there's not a house big enough for all that. But even if I had a house where there was um, <coughs> three wheelchairs and one ambulatory person, I can't do that with one staff. So the, the, the standard is not in the, con I mean, for mentor, it was written into their contract that it's a two, two, one. Is that right? Am I saying that two, one, two or two, two, one? Yeah. But if for all providers, when I was at York, I would base my staffing patterns on the plan that I had for that person and the supervision levels required for that, for the folks that are in that house. So some houses could be one person in there because of the needs of the folks, but my high management folks, I don't think I had anybody in a high management house that was less than, you know, constant visual on an outing, so I can't have one staff. I guess I'm, I'm less concerned about what the particular staffing requirement is and more concerned about whether this accountability plan is just kind of restating what that required staffing is already. I mean, are we just saying to them, you must you will follow the standard requirement? Yeah. And but we're but that's kind of a no, low bar. It's, well, mean, no, it's not it's not really a low bar. It is the fact that we're gonna check it to make sure it's being done. That is what is and we do this at other places. When we go in, if I have an outlier at a, um, of just a home we have in New York, during our annual review, they literally pull timesheets from random times to make sure that we are doing what we said we would do when we wrote that outlier, which is a fairly, that's, that's what it, but we pay outlier money, outlier dials. That means it's more than what we normally pay for a CTH placement, but the expectation is we're not checking it. So the bottom line is. So the bottom line is actually our place to check it more frequently to make sure it's being done to prove to you that they're doing what they say they're going to do. So we failed as an agency to uphold that standard. I don't think we set a standard for them. I don't. I don't think we set. We. I don't think there was an an expectation like we did for the outliers that we asked providers to do. Just like the assessment saying that this is still needed, we had to do that for an outlier every year. We have to send a rejustification packet. You're paying all this premium dollars to these high management folks, but you're not even asking them to do the minimum stuff you were asking the people to do for rather small dollar amounts. So it is just kind of leveling the playing field there. And the other things are best practice. All right. I have a question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. 
The last time we were asked to unfreeze mentor, and I know you're not asking us to do that today, you're asking us to approve this plan, and I haven't had really time to look it over either, but um, the last time we were asked to do it, David Goodell made the presentation, and we asked him, has your performance improved? Have you gone out there and have you looked, and, and you know, are they doing what you asked them to do, and his answer was no. So I guess I would ask the same thing this time. Have you gone out there and looked, and are they meeting the standards that have already been set for them? And if they're not, how are you going to enforce these? I mean, what is the, the one of the big things that an accountability plan has to have is consequences. And I think we have to add consequences if these things are not met. But if if they're not following and meeting, have you been out there and looked, or has somebody been out there and looked, and are we seeing improvement in meeting the minimum standards? I have been out there, and I have looked. And what I have seen is they have beefed up their um, behavioral department. Uh, they have, uh, the homes are, the, the houses I went to see are, are in good shape. And they do have uh, they do have the staffing requirements there. They've been they are and they're checking them. They're pulling. They have a system of pulling up their accountability, um, their pay stubs and not pay stubs, uh, timesheets, and making sure people are at work when they're supposed to be. So they're they're going behind their people to look. So there is improvement. What I did see is a willingness to join into a plan such as this and improve even more. What I am concerned about is there are some folks there that I see that are in high management beds that I would not consider high management because the accountability levels are an hour, two hours. If I've got a high management person, I'm not sure. And that is, and I don't want to put this on mentor. We're seeing that everywhere. So a mentor. And, and I want to know from you concretely, what do you see has changed between, I believe it was last summer that David Goodell brought this up. What, what's different between what's happened in the last six months to let us think that they're meeting the minimum standards and now they're, now they're going to go above and beyond? I'm just curious as to do we have some anything concrete to let us think that they might be complying with what we've already asked with the minimum requirements? I wish I could say that I know that because I didn't know where they were prior to me walking out there and looking, to be honest with you, um, Commissioner Thompson, I was not here. So, I mean, I walked out the door here in September and actually went to these places. Um, and so I can't answer that question in the way you want me to answer it. That's why I'm starting at ground zero and setting the benchmark out six months. I'll come back to you in six months and I can answer that question. But right now, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that the benchmark wasn't communicated clearly, and what I felt the benchmark was was get better. There was and no to benchmark. me, that's not a, that is not a benchmark. Flat out, there was. I will say that flat out, one of the biggest failures, despite I would say repeated requests from the commission <laughs> to set some sort of benchmark for them, was there was never a benchmark. There was nothing like this in place, and there was no way to legitimately for them to target anything to say we have now done beyond the bare minimums that well, we have no, met this we, objective. I mean, we, we never gave that to them. And, I, and when I say we, it's the commission. And, don't they have their licensing reviews like every other provider? They do. Yeah, but that's, but and that was part, when we when we brought that up, that, that was, that wasn't addressing our concerns. And that was part of the, the content. When we, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out have they shown good faith effort? Have they improved? And I, how do we know that? I mean, well, I don't. I mean, again, since I can't tell you what the baseline was before and where I am now, what I encountered in my visit was a willingness to put forth a good faith effort. I didn't hit up against. Oh, we're not doing that, and you're you're making. I didn't. I didn't get that. They okay. they asked us. They asked me, "What is my path forward?" And I said. One, we've got to collect the data. You've got to do your job, and then we're going to have to measure it. And we'll have to measure it at a smaller interval instead of waiting for a year to go by. The second thing is um, what I'm asking for is not really over and above. 
What, I, what I'm saying in here, we're already required to do training. We're required on doing training what folks need. Training. <coughs> They're not not doing training. They are. But to me, if I've got somebody who is violent and hurting somebody and I'm training on cooking and flossing teeth versus how do I feel inside when I'm getting angry? And how do I deal with that? And how can I help myself manage myself? I will never move forward. I will be in that same high management place hitting people but cooking the heck out of chicken. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking, and having good teeth. But I'm, I'm like, I want them to have good teeth. I want them to learn how to, to cook. But the truth of the matter, what's keeping them in that high restricted environment is the fact that they punch people. And we need to figure out how do we help them not do that. And so this is not, this is not anything we weren't doing at Max Abilities. So I'm not asking over and above. I'm, this, is common, this is a common sense solution. This is back to basics. This is training 101. So, and they're not the only ones that have lost sight of that. We are so busy because I asked them, I said, why are you training on cooking chicken and flossing teeth? And they, they said, well, DDSN told us that we were supposed to, to train on independent living skills. And I'm like, that's wonderful. However, when if we were independently living and I turn around and I punch my neighbor in the face, I am not gonna be independently living anymore. And so instead of seeing those behavioral goals as also independent living skills, they were just concentrating on those ADL type of things. And it's like, you gotta look past that. And truthfully, if anybody in here has read a behavior support plan knows that to me, that's like shooting fish in a barrel because your objectives are written. The things you need to train on are in your behavior support plan. So easily transferred to the daily plan and active treatment, or I'm sorry, that's an ICF term, term, skills training for that individual in their plan. I think that this is something that not just high management providers should do, everybody should be looking and saying to themselves, when you plan somebody, when you're doing somebody's plan, you ask the question, what is keeping them here? And for some people, it is the fact that they can't take care of their basic functions like going to the bathroom independently or bathing independently. And for some people, it's they shouldn't be punching people in the face. And so to me, it's just as clear as the nose on your face, but I think that we've lost sight of it trying to be clever. And it's not, it's basic. This is basic stuff. And um, I think that if people do this, we can actually move people on in their life and get some true outcomes, um, which I would like to see that, you know, John doesn't hit somebody anymore. And this should be a partnership. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. they've got yeah. their piece when it comes to accountability, but it, we've had our own failings mm -hmm. as an agency. We need to make sure that we're accountable and following up on right. the part that we're responsible Core for. Core function, and, monitoring is what we're supposed to be doing. And, and, and to address what, you, what you're saying, Vicki, as far as what their motivation is, all I'll tell you is I've had contact with their executive directorship where they've basically begged for for this said give me something that i'm working for uh give me something that i can work toward tell, tell, tell me tell me where the finish line is and we have failed not not through lack of requests i will say on the part of this commission um but we have failed to set a legitimate finishing line for them um, and, and their other motivation is, is, is the thing that, that you and I have talked about many times is what their, what their motivate, what their real motivation is here is, well, they're for profit and, and ulti ultimate, uh, the, the ultimate goal on their part is, is okay. to meet these requirements so they can look at how are they going to reinstate their profits. So they have the, they have the most basic motivation to meet these requirements of all. And that's where ours oversight comes into play to make sure that that drive for them to make profit doesn't come at the expense of the people that they're serving. Okay, but the, and I understand that, um, and the oversight that we have provided in the past, freeze, unfreeze, freeze, unfreeze, hasn't worked. And so we tried to do that little fine system thing a year and a half ago or two years ago. Gary, you chaired that committee and it was a big, it was a start. I don't know if anybody's ever been fined. I don't know if mentors been fined, but what, it was an attempt to hold people accountable and to face consequences if they don't, because that's been the problem with some providers. There are no consequences. And mentor has been the only one that I know of that's been 
under the freeze, unfreeze, freeze, unfreeze thing, and that's because it's been, I guess it was worse than some others, or it was discovered to be worse than others or something. There had to be a reason. But I guess if we're going to have an accountability plan, then don't we need to have consequences? Well, the consequence not be is they don't get to fill their vacancies, and that's a huge financial consequence, more so than a fine ever would be. Yeah. So, so you they do this in six months, you unfreeze them. What happens? Where are we going to be in the six months after that? I guess what I'm getting at is if they don't maintain a certain level, what are the consequences? Well, you have to think that some of this stuff was never even being reviewed in their annual review. We weren't looking at the assessments that this is a need that continues. We weren't even looking at, uh, let's pull those pay records from, we weren't doing it. So even we can say that they get an annual review through Alliant, this stuff wasn't happening for them. And it wasn't happening for any high management. The only people that it was happening for are the, the folks that are out there that have those specific outliers for individual people. <coughs> this is the only time that that kind of stuff was being reviewed. So. To me, I think that when you're paying premium price for additional staffing, that needs to be part of your review, whether we call it an outlier or we call it a high management home or we call it a, what do we call them, forensic? We've got way too many names. We've got to line that down, Let's streamline that too. Um, but whatever we call, when we are expecting an outcome because of a behavioral issue, that this goes along with it and um, not just you know, as a board, we were getting those pulled in our administrative review. I just don't want to look back on this next year and say, oh, we better freeze them again. I mean, what, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There needs to be. Well, two, well uh, let me ask you this. I had never seen this before. Um, oh, we talked about it last. Yeah. Well, that's well, fine. I, I not that written form. No, no, but you. written form. Had you read this before? What? This is. Have Sam, had you seen it? Yes. You'd seen it? Mm -hmm. Laura, I sent it to Big Not class. Okay. Yeah. It's something Vicky, we discussed. Did you get you it? weren't on the phone. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, we chatted about it, but not. What I want is, it's like she's saying, what is the, if in the event they have a problem, and I, this is just coming from me, I would like to know what are the consequences? Um, what's going to happen if in the event they don't do it? What's the current policy? I mean, yeah, what's, you know, they're frozen. They're frozen right now. They're not getting any more. But if they, you know, if supposedly. The consequences are they don't get to fill their vacancies. So that's going to be. The that point. is a huge financial yeah. incentive yeah. to do this. Yeah. I mean, more so than us saying we're going to give you a $100 fine. I mean, this is thousands of dollars. Right. And it, it's immediate now, as in if they were to get another vacancy, then it stays vacant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they've got what thirteen vacancies now? Or I, I don't. I, I don't know. Exactly. Right. It's, 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 it's enough that if I was I running that company, I'd be yeah. a wreck. They can't fill them back, yeah. and so well, any future yeah. vacancies yeah. until to me that's the and, consequence. And, and and here's the other thing: we again, there, there's certainly a desire on the part of certain members of the commission to not have four profits at all. But more importantly, if we set this plan up and they don't meet these very concrete standards, then I think we're in a much better, we're in a much stronger position to come to say, okay, just the freeze is not enough. Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at, are we gonna renew the contract with them? That's the ultimate thing, the ultimate question, but we have never had a set of benchmarks that we could legitimately go to them and say, you haven't done something, therefore we're not gonna do business with you. And it's always been this very nebulous, we don't like them attitude um and to me that makes a, a, a i mean this puts them on notice you meet this i think to, to unfreeze or or else and if you're not meeting this and we're not and, and of course it's going to require legitimate follow-ups in six months after the six months after the six months and the year you know we need to do that but if we give them standards and they're not meeting them that gives us something to, that gives us a, a weapon yeah okay does I someone agree. i agree with that it, can I ask for a motion? Does anybody want to make a motion? I would move to approve the accountability plan as presented with regard to mentor. Should we say and, we... Go ahead. Go ahead. And, and to instruct staff to develop this plan 
for all high management individuals. Amen. Okay. To I'll go say, beyond, to go beyond. We were going to do that anyway, but that's yes. great. Right. It's nice to have but the support needs, of the yes. commission. Yeah, it really yes. does. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It needs okay. to be understood that that's what we're mm -hmm. going to do. Right. The objective oh, yeah. is to start, with, start with mentor, <laughs> but address it to across the board. I second. <laughs> Any other discussion or all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Me. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So that is passed, and hopefully we'll get something done at that time. All right, Pat Maley, can we have the budget amendment, sir? Um, uh, good morning. Um, I'm here to uh, uh, present two additions to our approved budget on September 20th, and request your approval to add them as supplemental budget packages in the governor's office and the legislature. September 20th, uh, we presented the budget, which is a commission of approval for approximately $21.5 million. And today we're going to ask for two additions that total approximately a million dollars. Uh, if you go to tab five and you go to um, priority number four, this priority number four has been inserted. We're requesting $580,000 and $580,500. And the purpose is to establish, both requests today are basically to establish an ability to handle uh, crises and triage the uh, the, the uh, critical needs in the system. Uh, this one here is to add 12 uh, institutional respite beds in, uh, in the ICF setting. I think right now uh, Midlands and is the primary position, but I think we have to keep open the idea that it could be PD. Uh, I think the factor, a big issue of establishing these, or big constraint in establishing these, is having the direct care staff to actually staff them. Mm -hmm. Midlands is, uh, based on a recent study, it has really uh, a remarkable staffing levels. So I think it can handle the capacity. But we're looking for 12 beds approvals. And, and obviously, uh, we've talked about it for, for a long period of time. Handling the, the crisis response and the, and the high management needs in the system is critical. And, and, I, and I agree 100% with Mary in, after my review is, is we're just addressing the symptoms. If you really want to get after the problems, we have to basically do the actual work of rehabilitation and moving people to lesser standards. And I think that's the, that's the mission I feel. And uh, otherwise, we can't build enough housing. So uh, this is just a short-term solution, uh, but it is a needed solution. Uh, has huge provider support uh, for them to take some of the higher uh, higher needs consumers. They need some some equity from us to be able to handle the problems, stabilize them, and return to the community. Uh, so that's a request uh, for those 12 beds. And then what we did our prior uh, budget prior number uh, in, in September 20 our budget. Uh, Part number four is now five. So we moved it down one and we added two. We've added two components. September 20th, we asked for uh, 27 um, uh, uh, residential beds for high management or forensic, forensic residential beds. We're moving that to 36. Uh, we see the need. We feel like we have the capacity to put them to work if we do the planning and then we know this this year. And additionally, we're asking for uh, a four-bed CTA-2 for juveniles at a cost of uh, $93,000. And uh, uh, having looked at that particular issue, because with some of the other issues that we're seeing about how we need to uh, show the initiative to, to get more from our money. And uh, when we looked at the juvenile issue, uh, right now we have existing, we have eight Medicaid uh, beds in two CTH2 homes, and we have 14 slots in a group home at state funds. Uh, uh, even though Rufus is not a singer, Rufus went out there and looked at the site, and his, and his, and his persuasiveness, he basically said, we're gonna convert these state slots to residential beds. So our, our, belief, our goal is to ask for this money for one house to give us some immediate capacity at the same time internally look at those 14 slots, work with that provider, and develop residential settings that are that are final rule compliant so that we can get matching funds and we can turn those 14 slots into possibly 30 beds. And I think that's one of the things we're seeing is how do we convert these state funded beds to Medicaid beds and we're just going to have to 
uh, do the investments, which I think we can. So there are two requests, and okay. if you approve it, we'll make budget, uh, uh, budget package submissions to the Executive Budget Office, and we part of our presentation to the legislature uh, when the session starts. Okay. Do I have any discussion on that? Is the for number four? Is that sort of I, I, I recall in the past that we had the rapid response scheme idea yeah. in there, mm -hmm. and that sort of this is so the idea is that we're looking at the twelve. Mm -hmm. In play, yeah, yeah. and make up ICF. That was also state funded. Yeah, and there's no reason why we should have um, an institutional type of setting where they could be ICF bits and have them state funded. That didn't make sense. The reason we were talking about the problem with rapid response, you, you, it doesn't work. Um, and being a community provider, I've never unless you're ra unless you're between nine and five Monday to Friday, you really don't get much. But what we need is support. The, like I said, that safety net for the community and where we have resources. So that means staff and we have a psychiatrist at Midlands that can work with medication stabilization. That is one of the biggest problems in the community to get that done. Um, it's just a bear. But I think that also when we're talking about a community, uh, when, if this gets done, we would also talk about an agreement that needed to be signed to say, we're going to get this person stable and we're going to help you, but you're taking them back. Um, uh, the return policy is going to be changed, I think. So give people a chance. But I also think that if we would add all those other all the training issues we're talking about and how you train your staff and how you train the work with the individual to acquire skills, I think we get back, like I said, get back to basics because this is how we used to do it back in the day, folks. This is not new. Um, you know, but then when flare jeans came out, I never thought those were coming back either. So there we have it. You know, I think that this is stuff that we can do and do it. We did it well and we can do it well again. So, um, but that is, I know we were, I was expecting that question about you say we're going to do, I said, yeah, I'm just, I was never for it. I wasn't here, but I wasn't for that. I'm for this. I'm for a safety net. So is this the kind of bad, these 12 bads where Tanya would have been able to take her side? Potentially, yes. I would like to see a more of a juvenile setting for those individuals. That's why we want to develop the juvenile beds. Juvenile bed. Yeah. And specific uh, autism houses with that training in place. Yeah. <laughs> but we also have, um, DSS has got 18 people out there that kind of fall into our category that have been living in a hospital for like over a year. <laughs> because there's no place for them to go. So this problem is not unique, unfortunately. I, and I think that even if we do this, we will never be able to place everybody all the time, um, but we can do a better job. Okay. Any other discussion? I have a motion. I would move to approve the budget amendment, budget request amendment. Do you have a second? Sorry. Vicki, you hearing? Yes, yeah, uh huh. Are you? Okay, we have uh, a motion on the table. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any? What's your vote, Vicki? I can't hear you. Yes? Yes, uh huh. Okay. Um, the motion passes. Thank you very much. That's great. Rufus Britt. Uh, please talk to us about the camera uses in the regional centers. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Ms. LaBeouf for being here today. It took a lot of courage to come up here and tell your story. Well, well, uh, yes, ma'am. I'm here to present on uh, video surveillance initiatives uh, for our regional centers. It's in tab six of your notebook. Now, one of our primary responsibilities is to ensure uh, safety and accountability throughout our system. And one tool that can help us do that better is installing video cameras. In tab six, you have a draft directive, but these are some decision points that really get to the work that the staff have done here at EDSN. The policy is well done. It was a collaborative, <coughs> excuse me, a collaborative effort, but there are a lot of conversations we need to have with respect to hardware and software. And those decisions drive the policy and vice versa, but it also drive the costs. 
Uh, initially, I thought we could just go to Best Buy and pick up some cameras and install them ourselves, but given the infrastructure at the regional center, that will be akin to trying to put smartphone apps on a payphone. Our, our system is just outdated. But the, the system points that we need to really focus on, again, relate to the, the specifications. <coughs> We've engaged a couple of uh, state approved vendors to give us some information on cameras and equipment. Um, and you may think that, well, again, it's simple, but there's a lot of specific specificity in trying to design a system that can meet our needs, uh, given the layout of our facilities. And each dorms, uh, at least at Coastal, and we're looking to pilot this, uh, uh, this at Coastal Center, we have three different configurations. So depending on the dorm, it dictates how many cameras we need and the type cameras we need. Because there's some hallways, we wanna put cameras in common areas. So I wanna be clear on that, that we don't infringe upon any privacy or rights issues. But when a hallway bends, you have to have two different cameras. So there are these fish cameras that cost a little bit more. And so uh, once we get to the, 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 the bid sheet or the sample bid sheet that one vendor provided us and we'll get more, uh, it's important for us to really nail down or define the scope of equipment uh, and, and type of equipment that we want because that, that's going to dictate uh, our ability to get bids from other vendors so that we can make sure that we're, we're uh, good stewards of taxpayer dollars. Uh, also important, I want to make sure that we're not just beholden to the state contract. There is a method for us to uh, explore non-contract uh, or non-state approved contract uh, uh, vendors. There are certain caveats to being able to do that and we'll explore it. But again, once we define the scope of uh, our hardware and software, we'll engage in that. One important thing I, I would ask the commission to, to pay attention to and hopefully to help us infuse in our policy uh, is contingencies for non-consent. You know, we want this to be something that the individuals that live with us their families, uh, our staff, all embrace. And the next slide is gonna echo uh, some, some pre-work that we've already done to demonstrate that this is a positive initiative and moving forward, you know, it's the right path for us as an agency. Not moving forward, but be irresponsible. And again, I think the next slide will detail that. Uh, stakeholder input. Prior to coming here, I had the opportunity to meet with several parent groups uh, who have loved ones that reside at our regional centers. Uh, I met with the Witten Center Parents Club and thank you, Ms. Roberts, and uh, you know, for all your efforts. And also I met with uh, or talked on the phone with Mr. Johnson, who's the chairman of the Coastal Regional Center. And I phoned the leadership uh, for the PD and Salibi uh, centers. And I just asked them, I told them, I said, I'm meeting with the commission, I'm not a great presenter, so give me some, uh, some, some notes that I can, that I can share but give me your, your honest opinion about installing cameras. And I was just overwhelmed with the response rate. Um, in fact, uh, somebody emailed me about two o'clock in the morning the other night. And there was a young lady that uh, her son has lived at Witten Center, I think for 40 years. But the short of it, uh, 100% and I received about 20, 24 emails, all positive. All saying, we've been waiting for this. We've been waiting on the department to move forward with this initiative. The cons that are listed, those were just uh, snippets or, or comments from a couple parents who also endorsed cameras, but wanted, wanted to make sure that, again, we took in consideration that this could uh, be perceived by staff as, you know, we're spying on them and, 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 dis and we'll create distrust, which would exacerbate our workforce shortages. But again, if you're doing the right thing, this should not be an initiative that you're afraid of. Rights and privacy issues, well, um, again, the same parent brought this up, and we're going to place cameras only in common areas. We're, we're not going to violate uh, rights, uh, privacy, and respect of the individuals we support and their families. And then one parent uh, mentioned the cost and said, why invest in this and not put money in paying staff more? And we have, and I responded to her to let her know that we had a couple different initiatives to raise direct care pay and that the monies that we would use for this are already uh, earmarked for physical plan improvements. Right, thank you. Yep. Here are the state approved vendors. We've engaged two vendors, uh, A3 and Code Links, and this is just to help us design a bid package. Uh, Code Links is actually going to visit the Coastal Center next week to install cameras in our, one of our administrative buildings for a week so that we can actually see the, the equipment and how it works in, in the video feed because there's different uh, speeds and technology, so they'll give us an example of that. 
And that way we'll be informed buyers when we decide to procure this. Uh, I got to tell you something before Vicki does. You got to have three bidders. We, <laughs> those weren't bids. Those weren't bids. We're not, we don't even have the bid package together. No, she's, about, I, she's about to say it. So I know. I, they're I, not. I, I told Rufus, I said, make sure you say these are not bids. Okay. No. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm just telling you. So okay. All right. I'm just, I'm just telling you the way it is. Yeah. So that, that helps expedite the process. Okay. Yeah. All One right. of the things I would ask the commission, I think we have a pretty good draft, you know, with respect to a policy, and I would welcome public input. So I know there's a policy committee, but if we can put this on the uh, front burner so that we can move forward in executing this plan, I, I think it's worthwhile. And again, thank you to all the parents that have commented and for the staff. Uh, uh, there have been IT folks. Uh, policy and operations working together. There's been a lot of collaborative efforts um, and feedback from commissioners. But, uh, I just want to thank everybody for all their efforts. Great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Um, I, do you have any? I, really, Eva, I just want to say I think it's a really solid policy. Really good effort, first ever. And, you know, they just, they just did a great job on it. And thank you for your leadership on it because I know that you've been pushing for this for a long time. Okay. But, you know, I would say that it's ready to send out for public comment. I don't know why it would have to come back through the policy committee first, you know, in order just to get it going. But I just want to say that. Any other? I, I, there, there's, there's one area of comment that I would give, which is the retention policy that somebody else has already highlighted. Right now, it's a 30-day cycle. Yes. Um, as somebody who in my business routinely deals with body cams and can't, I will tell you 30 days, it's that, that's a low number. Um, I, I think at a minimum, we need to put something in place where any incident that is reported, that that video is immediately preserved indefinitely Actually, because it, 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 that happens all the time. There was video then, but it's gone now. Yeah. So that, Okay. Speaking to that specific situation, that's actually in the draft directive. Okay. It's an incident that's tied. Okay. Um, you know, to that we have it on surveillance. It's okay. Preserved and up until the disposition, and then 30 days post. Okay. The 30 day uh, time frame is an industry standard. So the two vendors that we met with, that was their recommendation. They worked with a number of agencies, and they said this is the industry standard. As you increase retention, you have to get uh, uh, bigger servers and then increase your costs. I think we we're taking. In part because, of, and I know what the industry standard is, but in part, one of the issues we deal with with our particular community is a lot of the people can't report, and it may be that the report comes third. You know, it, that worries me. Yeah. Thirty days, and I think, and I'm not saying we have to, but I would, I would like to see more talking with the vendors. I understand they say that's industry standard, but our industry isn't. We're not standard. standard. Um, and I just, I think we'll be looking from a cost standpoint, it would be worthwhile for us to know what are we talking about if we want to increase that number to 60 days or 90 days. I'm not saying it definitely, but um, okay. I think we'll be, I encounter that a lot okay. in my particular yeah. business. And exactly why we need to be set for public comment. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. Thank you. Any, any other comments? What did you just say about public comment? I think I think this, Gary's just highlighting the yeah. reason it's Why? got to go out for public yeah, comment. Yeah, it's got to go to public yeah. comment. Yeah. Okay. That was my only concern about bypassing the, the mm -hmm. committee. Yeah. We're not bypassing yeah. the yeah. committee. We're just not going to bring it to the committee first, then put it out for public comment. Right. Let's put it out now. Yeah. And give it a longer public comment period because it's such a vital policy. we got to be careful about how we do it. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Have a comment? Do you have a motion on this? I guess the motion is yeah. that we uh, issue this for public yes, sir. comment okay. and then to the policy committee. All right. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Vicki, you here? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, Susan Beck, personal care and respite assessment, <coughs> IDRD, CS, and Haskey waiver enrollees. Good morning. We're in tab seven. We are still um, for your approval. I'll be presenting um, the revised respite and personal care attendant care personal assistance assessment. That's a mouthful, um, but I know you received these materials in advance. You also have them in your binders. Um, the actual guidance documents and the assessments. Um, if we've got the slides queued up. What do I do again? I press the screen or the play? It was email. Okay, I can do it without. Um, 
about a year ago, the um, last revisions to the personal care and respite assessments um, were enacted. They were put in place, case managers began um, doing those assessments. Over time, we looked at how the results of those assessments. And we noticed that after the reconciliations were done, um, there were about 170 cases or so um, where individuals that were assessed actually had a reduction in services. So um, in August of 18, um, at the time, Interim Director Pat Maley um, issued a memo, put an interim plan in place for us to proceed, I think when Mary got here, to um, revise these assessments. And then also, um, you know, be really clear with case managers that they should go back for any of these 120 people, look at their actual assessments, reassess if needed, look if any conditions changed, and then provide good justification. So anytime a case manager um, submitted those, we accepted those recommendations of case managers, kind of a stopgap interim plan. So that was in place. Um, then we began, as I said, once Mary got here and we kind of got our direction moving. Um, October 17th, we, we um, were able to put out our first draft of the respite assessment. Um, again, we got a lot of public input. We gave a lot of opportunities for public input, not only to our whole provider community, but also um, <coughs> thanks to policy committee, one of the recommendations was to create a directives policy interest group. So those are all of our kind of advocacy um, stakeholders as well as anybody who said they wanted to be added to that group. So we not only had providers, but we potentially had, you know, advocates and the other kind of family serving agencies also reviewing those. <coughs> and input. So then um, uh, November 6th, we put out the personal care assessment revision. Then uh, um, so, uh, November 21st, we put the respite and the personal care assessments out again after they revised. So we've had that kind of cycle of repeated input. We didn't want to take one set of comments, make changes and say we're done. We wanted to put it out again and get feedback and see if we had any additional changes. And then, of course, policy committee received these drafts on um, December 3rd and then December 6th with the packet the commission received those. And I know it's a lengthy um, amount of documents. Um, after the commission approves, hopefully in the near future, meaning today or some other time, um, because these are waiver services, um, approval will be required from Department of Health and Human Services. Then we'll train case managers in the use of the new assessments. Then they'll be instructed to reassess any participants using the revised assessments as needs arise or as policy dictates. The way it works with um, waiver services is an assessment must be repeated annually. So in as well as whenever conditions change, whenever the needs of the person changes or the services change. So that's a that's just a cycle that, that will naturally happen, but certainly if there are concerns, then the case manager should be assessing earlier. Um, and then once those assessments start coming in, our staff have a, a system in place to look at them, to really make sure the case managers have scored appropriately, um, that anytime there is uh, change in services, whether we're looking at past utilization, and we're working with case managers to really justify why that change is happening. So we're kind of screening through any of those adjustments instead of just accepting it as a reduction or a change. Um, sorry you don't have a slide with this. It's a lot better when you see it in person, but I'll just um, remind you when we put out the, um, the memo um, August 9th from Pat, um, we also kind of shared in his commission presentation that month this quote, so I'm going to read it. When new respite and PCA assessments are implemented, there is no guarantee <coughs> consumers' future waiver plan authorizations will not be reduced in as much as the Medicaid waiver is a needs-based program using criteria assessments and consumer corresponding justification to determine the appropriate service level. So as assessments are revised, as people's conditions change, you know, that need has to be reestablished, and it's possible that there may be changes. Um, so looking at those changes um, for the personal care, attendant care, personal assistance assessments, and the respite assessments, so the whole group, um, the team looked at adjusting the guidance for clarity. Um, case managers can sometimes mis you know, kind of interpret differently based on their own experiences and their own, own kind of comprehension. Um, so we made sure that the guidance was as clear as possible and responded to questions we got from case managers. I interpret it this way. What do you think about this? Um, where possible, we also 
adjusted the responses in the assessment to match the wording in the case management annual assessment. So the categories and the terms and the responses were as parallel as possible. So we weren't using one kind of coding schema and then using another with this. So they jive better now. So we think that'll be better for implementation. Um, overall, and you do have a document in your file called change summary. Um, I'll just go over quickly, kind of categorically, um, how we implemented the changes in the assessment. For the personal care, attendant care, personal assistance assessment, I say those all together because among the, the three waivers, the services are similar but termed differently. Um, we've adjusted labeling. Um, we've provided more comprehensive scoring responses so that there's more variety and we feel like it better reflects the needs of the person so that it turns out that the score is more representative. And then um, based on feedback from case managers, we also changed from using like a percentage of support needed, the percentage of time someone needed help dressing or something like that, um, to um, monthly, daily, weekly. They felt more comfortable with that sort of frequency versus estimating kind of a math percentage. And I liken it to if somebody says, how far is that car away? Is it 300 yards, 200 yards? I have no idea. Um, but how frequently do I see a car? That's a lot easier. So we made those kinds of changes and it really felt like it was more in, in line with what case managers needed. Um, for the respite assessment, we combined the respite assessment with this separate form that was a respite exception request. So if there's justification to go beyond, um, beyond the soft cap, there would, there would be additional documentation needed on this exception form. So we just merged them together, a little bit less separate paperwork for case managers. Um, we also looked at the, um, the way we were looking at responses to better assess the impact on families when they experience isolation, because you, you need a little bit more time away to get a little break if you're very isolated because of the needs of the individual you're supporting, the family member. Um, we also looked at their stress level. So um, use, we're using a um, I wanted to say standardized assessment. It's a, a national assessment by the American Medical Association on caregiver stress. So we looked to see what other states were using and looked at other tools and decided to put that in place. So we've got this sort of same kind of assessment that's used nationally for a variety of other fields as well. And um, then we also looked at the workload. So if you know the family is caring for a variety of people, then obviously their needs or respite may be different than if they're just caring for one. So we feel like these changes are very positive. We got good feedback and wherever possible, we accept the recommendations that were submitted to us. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you have any, um, she's looking for a motion on this. Do um, we have any more discussion? Nope. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you have any discussion on, on this? I mean, I think it's, been, it's a big improvement over the tools we've been using, and I, I didn't read every page of it, but it looks good to me. It looks like a really good improvement. Can I, I get wonder a... how many people will be will be have their benefits reinstated. We're going to, um, that I was just going to see, I, I figured there'd be a question on that. We are going to, like we promised, go back and look at the ones that were drastically reduced and use <coughs> new tool to reassess. Okay. So that's the next step. But we also changed the process of reviewing denials. It's, it's not, there's not a letter written for me to tell me what I'm doing. They come in, they sit with me and we staff each case. And then when we write the letters, we remind families that this is not a one and done thing. Actually, nothing we do is one and done. That if something changes, the situation changes, or they need more hours, they can come back and request it. And I think that has taken that anxiety level way down because it's not like you'll never can have these hours if you, you know, if you it becomes a need for them, it comes back through a budget request. So a plan amendment. And I think that by changing the letters, simplifying them, staffing stuff, putting the good news first, um, I think gets folks to read the entire letter. They're much shorter uh, to the point, which is basically how, except okay. for the commission meeting. Okay, <laughs> great. All right, do I have a motion on this? I move we approve the um, 
personal care and respite assessment that is presented and moved along to HHS for approval. Okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Pat? Pat Maley is going to discuss the money. All right. Uh, this is just the uh, monthly budget update. We get tab eight. You know, the key issue is down there in the uh, color section. Just just okay. Yeah. 41.6% through the year, and we spent 42.8% of our funding. So we are overspending about 1.17%. You look at last month, we overspent about 0.7%, which is a very nominal number. It's two or three million dollars, but at the same time, the trend is more rather than less, and that's always in the direction of badness. So, given how thin we are with uh, our revenue and expenditure projections, uh, we pulled all of our uh, non non service contracts, and we're going to examine all our non service expenses so that we can, I uh, know uh, Mary hates this term, rack and stack our options in January <coughs> as we dig into these numbers. Because as you get to the second half of the year, you can you can juggle a percent. But we got to get ahead of the percent. So I'm not saying anything wrong. I mean, part of this is uh, 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 you know, baby net could have expenses of which are reimbursable. I just think we have to dig into that number a little bit more. Once it gets above the percent, it gives me concern that uh, uh, it could be a trend. So we'll look at that, and next month I'll report as to is it a trend or is it an anomaly. We have a lot of one-time expenses at the beginning of the year. We had a big, a big payout um, for the retirement uh early in the year so it's not a number to be alarmed about but it's a number to know more about by next by next time uh also um vicky sent us some schedules to look at and i agree we need better reporting particularly on the revenue side because the revenue side is what's going to hurt us not getting medicaid revenue so i, I plan on uh we, we checked it again informally this month because it is a very complicated projection and uh, as uh, our accounting manager does projection says, he feels as good as he felt last month. I got to give you something more concrete halfway through the year. So in January, we got to give you some projections. Uh, and right now he feels better than he thought he would be feeling this time of year. So right. that'd be why we feel good expenses as a percent and we'll dig into it for uh, before next time so that the second half of the year, we don't have to go in front of the general assembly needing money. Thank you, Pat, appreciate <laughs> it. All right. Um, since we're not having an executive session, we're going to have something even better. Mary wants us to see a, um, a little video on Buddy Walk. Mm -hmm. yeah, I got to go to the Charles uh, the Down Syndrome Association of the Low Country. I was supposed to do this before my, my report. Totally forgot. Just reminded me. Um, but uh, so I would like you to see it. It's something to walk out of here with a smile on your face about. It would be nice. Joel's on the stage just for a shot. Kids are not make sure of that, but yeah. I think he's on the stage. Faces are just good. Josie in the chair. 
Thank you so much for sharing us. Y'all, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas or a Happy Holidays. And our next uh, meeting will be January 17th, 2019.